All right, well, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, maybe a couple other people will be coming in um, as well. Uh, let me give Dr. Grotes a, a proper introduction and then I'll pray and he can uh, he can get started. Uh, Dr. Grotes is the professor of philosophy at Denver Seminary. He got his PhD and uh, from the University of Oregon. Uh, he's also taught at Seattle Pacific University, University of Oregon. He's the author of many books. I linked to his Wikipedia uh, article uh, earlier, but uh, probably your biggest books, Dr. Grotice, would be your book on apologetics, uh, Truth, Decay, and The Soul in Cyberspace. Probably that's your, your top three. Well, Soul in Cyberspace didn't sell very well, but I think the the most significant book is my Christian apologetics textbook. So I uh, highly recommend that as a resource. He's written for numerous scholarly journals, magazines, editorials for, for newspapers. And uh, I had the pleasure, and my wife had the pleasure of having Dr. Grotheis for a course uh, a long time ago, back in, in 2008. And uh, I learned a lot from that course, learned how to love the Lord our God with all of our minds. Um, and then also there was a year where Dr. Grotheis and my wife and I attended the, the same church and I got to know him a bit more there. Um, but I'm really thankful he uh, is here to share with us. Um, and uh, I know we'll all profit from it. Uh, so let me pray for us and I'll, I'll hand it over to him. Father God, we thank you for this, this time. We thank you for uh, the technology to be able to connect uh, thousands of, of miles apart. Uh, I just thank you for uh, Dr. Grotas, Dr. Grotas, the calling on his life um, that you've put to, to share the gospel, uh, to share the reason uh, for the hope that we have in you. We, we pray that you would bless this time. Uh, uh, may we all profit from it. May we draw closer to you and closer to each, each other. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Well, thank you, Clint. It's been quite a while since I've seen you or Missy. You have several children now, right? Two or three children? Uh, three and one on the way. So. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, that's terrific. Well, let me uh, maybe just say a little bit more about myself before I get into this outline. What I'd like to do is give you an overview of Christian apologetics, which is defending Christianity as true, rational, and pertinent to the whole of life. I became a Christian almost exactly 46 years ago. I was uh, baptized shortly after I accepted Christ as Savior and Lord in June of 1976. And I think a story helps explain my calling. Right before I became a Christian, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I told him I was thinking about becoming a Christian. And he said, well, Doug, if you become a Christian, you will associate with Christians, you'll go to a church, you'll read Christian books, and you won't be a critical thinker anymore. Well, I became a Christian shortly after that, and I think that I have proven my friend John wrong. Because what I've done over all these years is pursue degrees in philosophy. I have a PhD in philosophy. And I've written a number of books. And I've really tried to consider the truth claims of Christianity against other worldviews. So throughout my teaching and writing, I've addressed atheism and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and agnosticism and god has given me the time and the opportunities to study teach and write on these topics so i believe my confession is that the christian worldview the christian faith is in fact objectively true it's true to what is and it makes sense it is rational it's convincing and that it gives us meaning and significance and value in life far more than any other perspective could <clears throat> and the 
test of this, I think, for me and also my my first wife, who's now with the Lord, was the fact that Becky contracted a very rare form of dementia. She was diagnosed in 2014. And Becky had been an editor and a writer. She had edited all of my books. And we found out she had a degenerative frontal temporal lobe disease that was called primary progressive aphasia and aphasia takes away speech. So she had difficulty speaking and as time went on, she just lost her abilities to do much of anything. And she passed away about four years ago. And through that, our Christian faith was tried and tested and it was extremely painful and difficult. It was a heavy, heavy load for both of us. But let me give you one example of how significant apologetics is. Uh, Becky and I were on our way to go out to eat, and she was lamenting, as she should, about her condition. She was really a very brilliant woman. And I said, Becky, I know it's horrible, but one day you and I will be in the new heavens and the new earth, and we will... Uh, be dancing and singing and there'll be no curse and no pain and no tears and she looked at me and said but is it really true is it really true and I said Becky do you think I'm smart and she said yes and I said do you remember that big apologetics book that I wrote defending Christianity and she said yes I do and I said you believed all the arguments in that book and I assure you that what we believe is true. And it really encouraged her. That wasn't the end of our struggles. She continued to lament and experience a lot of frustration and anguish over her condition. But I would often read to her passages from Revelation 21 and 22 about the new heavens and the new earth, where there are no tears and no pain and no suffering and we're face to face with God and all the redeemed in this paradise, uh, which is at the same time a city, a garden and a temple. It's really amazing. And I would read her from 1 Corinthians 15, which speaks of the resurrection of the body, that we will be raised immortal, incorruptible, just as Christ was raised from the dead. Becky and I had worked very hard at having a rational, compelling Christian faith for over 30 years. And so our conviction that what the Bible teaches is true, that God is there and God is holy and just and loving, really carried us through the times when we did not feel God's presence or we didn't feel God's love for us. Even if I could not feel that or sense that, I still knew it was true because of how God had confirmed his reality in my life through a long walk with him, and through my studies. This means that apologetics is not merely an academic exercise. You can become very academic with apologetics. My book, the second edition of Christian Apologetics, is over 800 pages long, and I haven't counted all the footnotes, but I'm sure it's well over 1,000 footnotes. Lots of carefully stated arguments, considerations of rebuttal to those arguments. But it's very much a real life day-to-day -day situation because 1 Peter 3.15 says that we should have a reason for the hope with, that is within us. We should have a defense of what we believe when people ask us why we believe. What is the hope that we have? And that we should present this hope realizing that Christ is Lord. We revere Christ as Lord in our hearts. Therefore, we defend the truth of the gospel and the Bible. So let me begin uh, the outline proper with another story. This is not my story. You've probably heard of a man named Steve Jobs, passed away about 10 years ago. He was a genius with computers. He invented the iPhone. He was a multi-million or billionaire, I don't know. But when Steve Jobs was a young man, about 14, 
he went to his pastor and said, pastor, does God know everything? And the pastor said, yes. And then he held up a photo of a starving child. This was part of the famine in Biafra in the early 1970s. And he held up this photo and said, did God know ahead of time this would happen? And the pastor said, Steve, this is a hard issue, but we just have to have faith. And that's all he said. So Steve Jobs walked out of the pastor's study, walked out of the church, and never went back to the church again. In fact, he became a Buddhist of some kind. Now, the issue that young Steve Jobs raised is something called the problem of evil. I have a long chapter about this in my apologetics book, and we'll touch on it. But the problem says, if God is all good and all powerful, then there wouldn't be as much evil in the world. There seems to be a lot of pointless evil in the world that doesn't seem to do much good or any good. So, if God is all good, he wouldn't want that to happen. If God is all powerful, he could stop it. So this is, an, this is a challenge to the Christian worldview, the rationality of the biblical view of life. Now, it's a tough issue. <clears throat> and I've wrestled with it in many ways, both philosophically and personally, psychologically, as I mentioned. But the pastor could have said, well, Steve, that's a question of the ages people have been asking that since day one basically or ever since the fall the bible addresses these kinds of issues so why don't we get together and talk about it let's read something like the problem of pain by c.s lewis together what i'm saying is that that pastor could have used apologetics to help this young thoughtful man steve jobs but instead, he merely deferred to faith. Just, we need to have faith. Now, we do need to have faith, but we can have an informed faith, a reasonable faith, a faith based on fact and evidence. But sadly, a lot of Christians hold to this view called fideism, which says that our religious beliefs have no logical or rational support. Is simply a matter of believing or maybe having an experience, some experience of God. But you couldn't give arguments for things like the existence of God, the reliability of the Bible, the deity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. But in fact, ever since the beginning of Christianity, Christians have been defending the faith. They've been doing apologetics. In fact, Jesus engaged in apologetics. He defended what he believed about the Old Testament, about morality, about salvation, and he never lost an argument. He was really a kind of special philosopher. He used rational arguments to make points, and he also had a coherent worldview that he laid out. And the Apostle Paul, we see in the book of Acts, was an apologist as well, a defender of the faith. You see this especially in Acts 17, where he deals with the Greek philosophers and gives a very eloquent, brilliant speech challenging these unbelievers who didn't have an Old Testament background the way uh, the Jews of the time would have or the God-fearers would have. So we see the need to do apologetics in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, many other passages and then we also see examples of people having an apologetic ministry with Jesus and with the Apostle Paul. So a biblical view of reality should be a matter of faith. Yes, we want to trust God, place our trust in the Lord personally, an act of trust, an ongoing act of trust. But also we should seek intellectual fulfillment. That is, we should have a theology of the intellect. Uh, we are to take every thought captive to obey Christ. We should, as Paul says in Romans 12, be transformed through the renewing of our minds. Or as Jesus said, when he was asked for the greatest commandment, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, 
And the second is like it, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus didn't come to take away our minds. He came to take away our sins. And we don't somehow crucify the intellect. We crucify the flesh or anything raised up against the knowledge of God. But we can submit our intellect to the ways of God, to scripture, without hurting the intellect. Actually, we make our intellect more healthy when we view things through the lens of scripture and when we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in doing this, we need to, to use Jesus' language from Matthew 10, be wise as serpents or shrewd as serpents and innocent as innocent as the dove, meaning we should really think hard about how to communicate the truth of Christianity to whomever we're interacting with. And sometimes uh, people will not just listen to a straightforward case for Christianity. You have to ask questions and maybe prod them or poke them a little bit. So we need to be shrewd in how we interact, not dishonest, but shrewd and be innocent. That is, we should never engage in anything like propaganda, manipulation, <clears throat> trickery of any kind. And then also, if you want another biblical animal as a model, Proverbs 28, one says that the wise person is as bold as a lion. So we should not shrink back. We should seek out opportunities to witness to our faith. We should engage people intellectually and not run away from that. So if you're in a discussion with an unbeliever, and they raise an objection to Christianity that you don't know how to answer. <clears throat> the proper response to that is to admit it and say, that's a good question. I need to think about this more. Let me get back to you. I will do some research. I'll study it out a little bit more. And then when you get that confidence intellectually and spiritually, you can be more bold and you can break into more and more Ter territory. You can bring the gospel into the unbelieving world increasingly as you develop in your understanding of the Christian worldview and in apologetics. <clears throat> so that's points one and two. Um, I, think, I think what I'll do, uh, Clint, would it be good to pause for questions once in a while as I go through it? Do you want to save those until the end? Do you have a preference? Uh, no preference. Okay, so why don't I just ask at this point if you have any questions about points one and two? The need for defending Christianity is true, rational, and pertinent. Any questions? Any questions so far? <clears throat> okay. All right, let me go to point three. Making the positive case for Christianity now, I think the best way to approach apologetics is to defend and commend Christianity as a worldview. And you've probably heard of that word. You're familiar with it. But a worldview is basically a set of assumptions about the basic makeup of the world. So what is the ultimate reality? Who are we as human beings? What is the basis for morality? Can human beings be saved? Is there spiritual liberation? What is the right way to live? What is the good life? These are all worldview questions. Now, you can lay out the biblical worldview using several different schemes. Um, let me give you one that I find is helpful, and that is the idea of creation, fall, and redemption. So when you read scripture, you see that God created the world he said, it is good, it is good. And then when he creates human beings on day six, he says, it is all very good. So he puts his blessing and benediction upon creation after he makes human beings in his own image and likeness. And then we see after Genesis one and two, that human beings rebel against God. They do the one thing he told them not to do. They listen to the voice of the tempter, the serpent. And therefore, sin enters the world. 
and human beings fall. So this means that a curse comes upon the world, the death enters, human death enters the scene, there's increase in pain and struggle and so on. So that is the second act, if you will. There's creation. God created all things good. God is a personal moral creator who is distinct from his creation. And then human beings fall and this affects them. It affects all of nature. But the third category of the Christian worldview or the Christian story is redemption. So God does not leave the human race to itself. He doesn't abandon his creatures, but he continues to reveal himself in nature, in conscience. He sends prophets. He creates for himself a nation, Israel, and promises that a liberator, a Messiah, will come, who is Jesus Christ. And we see through Christ, <clears throat> through his life, death, resurrection, ascension, that God has acted decisively in history to redeem us, that Christ lived a perfect life of obedience to the Father, that he died on the cross to atone for our sins. He did for us what we could not possibly do for ourselves by paying a penalty we could not pay and taking our punishment upon himself vicariously. And then we see that death could not hold him, that he was declared with power the Son of God, through his resurrection. And Christ is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He is Lord over all things. He has authority in heaven and on earth. And the church is commissioned to take this message to the world, to disciple the nations, and to baptize converts in the name of the Trinity. Christ will come again to make all things right, to have the last word. So this is one way of looking at the Christian view of reality is in terms of a big story, creation, fall, redemption. And redemption, we can locate in terms of the work of Christ. And then after the first coming of Christ, in the, everything is fulfilled at the second coming of Christ. So that's one way of laying out a Christian worldview, creation, fall, redemption. Let me talk about the best way to defend the Christian perspective. I think what we need to do is say that our worldview explains the most important questions or answers the most important questions that people have about where did the world come from? What is a human being? What is the meaning of history? And so on. So, <clears throat> We present Christianity as this account of reality, this worldview, and then we defend it in various ways. So we defend it as logically coherent. We say that the facts support the Christian view. And we also say that Christianity gives meaning to life and death, to happiness and suffering. It gives us a way to be good citizens and godly people and so on through the truth of scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit. So a best explanation will be non-contradictory. It will be factual and livable. And when you're doing apologetics, you consider what your own perspective is. You wanna work on that, keep reading the Bible, keep attending church, develop your knowledge of scripture, keep submitting yourself to the will of God, and ask the Lord to bring you people who want to know about the gospel, who are open in any way, or bring people who are not open, but who may become more open to the truth through your testimony. So keep a lively, engaged Christian life. And then also when you interact with other people, you try to determine what their perspective is. Because if there's a Christian worldview, there's also an atheist worldview and a Islamic worldview and various other worldviews. So, for example, let me compare 
the Christian worldview for a minute with atheism. So Christianity teaches in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Atheism says there's no creator and the universe has always existed or it began to exist a finite time ago, but there was no creator. It just popped into existence out of nothing, out of nowhere. And that is a very irrational view, but some atheists hold that. Human beings then are nothing but a combination of matter and energy that is arranged through purposeless, impersonal, natural laws. Uh, there is no meaning to history. There is no final judgment. There are no miracles. There is no afterlife. The only hope that human beings have on atheism is somehow science will increasingly solve various problems in society and medicine and psychology and so on. So you see how radically different an atheist worldview is from a Christian worldview in every way. And the job of apologetics, Christian apologetics, is to show that the Christian perspective is better supported factually, logically, and personally, existentially, than any other worldview. So maybe you are interacting with someone who is an atheist, and they say, I think atheism is supported by science. People used to believe in God and angels, but now science explains everything without God, without the supernatural. So what you need to do is say, well, all right, what is your worldview? Uh, does it give you any purpose and meaning in life? You can start at that level, but you can also, as a Christian apologist, appeal to science. Science is one of the places that we find support for the idea of a creator and a designer. And there's a lot to be said about this, but what I wanna do in the next few minutes is talk about two disciplines, uh, cosmology and biology, and show that the best science actually supports God as the creator and the designer. Now I talk about I talk about this a lot in my book Christian Apologetics, and uh, let me pull this up for you. This um, this is the second edition of the book published by University Press. You can tell it's quite big, quite thick, and I probably have I don't know. 150 pages or more on the scientific evidence for the existence of God. And what I'm going to do is give you kind of a survey. And certainly other apologists have worked in this area like Stephen C. Meyer in his terrific book, Return of the God Hypothesis. And also William Lane Craig has defended the uh, cosmological argument, the design arguments and so on. J.P. Moreland is has done really good work in this area. But let's start with what the Bible says about nature. Uh, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay, so that's what scripture says. Do we have anything from nature, from the scientific investigation of nature, to show us that that statement is in fact true? We do. There is scientific evidence for the absolute beginning of the universe out of nothing, okay? And the technical term for this is a Latin phrase. It is uh, creation ex nihilo, means out of nothing. Now, but the Bible teaches that. Uh, for example, John 1, in the beginning, was the word, and the word was with God and the word was God, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing has been made that nothing has been made uh, that has been made. So the word created all things, all right? The word is the Logos. This is another name for the pre-incarnate Christ. And of course, Genesis one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So this doctrine of ex nihilo creation is fundamental to a biblical worldview. Let me talk about a few features of 
cosmology that led scientists to believe that the universe had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. The first was that Einstein's general theory of relativity, when corrected, predicted an expanding universe, a universe that's getting bigger and bigger. And if it's getting bigger and bigger, it must have started from a place of smallness or singularity. And then in the 1920s, uh, two scientists corrected the error and showed that this general theory predicts an expanding universe. In 1929, the American astronomer Hubble detected what's called the redshift in distant galaxies. And this indicated that what was further away was moving at a greater speed. So you had more evidence that the universe was expanding. And there's also the detection of cosmic background radiation, which is understood as left over from the initial condition of the universe, the beginning of the universe. You also have the reality of the thermodynamics of the universe, the second law of thermodynamics, which says that available energy is running down. And if the universe was infinite in time, all and finite, all the usable energy would already be run down and there'd be no, no life, no entities dependent on using energy. Well, we do have entities dependent on using energy, such as everyone who is listening to this and myself. So the idea there is that if everything is running down, the usable energy is not available, then the universe can't be infinite in age because it would have already completely run down, but it has not. So the upshot of all this is that everything in the universe, the whole universe, can be traced to what is called an initial singularity. So let me quote two scientists, I have this in the outline, Barrow and Tipler from their book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. At this singularity, space and time came into existence. Literally nothing existed before the singularity. So if the universe originated in such a singularity, we would truly have a creation ex nihilo. Notice that these scientists are not appealing to the Bible. They're appealing to the scientific evidence. So what you have is multiple lines of evidence converging on an absolute beginning or absolute origination of the universe. The alternative theories have failed, the steady state theory, the oscillating universe theory, and the big, this is called Big Bang cosmology. That's the popular word for it. Uh, it's actually called the standard model. And it is the best attested theory of the universe. My first book, the first edition of Christian Apologetics came out in 2011. And the evidence, the arguments were very strong for the Big Bang. And I studied this out more for the second edition and I'd been following it all along. I thought, well, maybe some other theory has come about that is as good, that explains as much of the data as the Big Bang Theory. And various theories in what's called cosmology are floated here and there, but it's still the case that this view that everything came from nothing a finite time ago is the best attested theory. And it converges with scripture that God created everything out of nothing a limited time ago. Now, let me go a little deeper into this, thicken it up a little bit. If you believe that everything came out of nothing, you have basically two choices. The atheists who have to believe that everything came out of nothing because of the science, because of cosmology, can say that everything came out of nothing without a cause and without a reason. Or they can cease to be atheists and say that there's a being outside of time and space who is immensely powerful, who brought about the universe, who is the first cause. Now, what they often do is say, no, we don't want to grant a God. We just say that everything popped into existence a very long time ago. Now, that's very 
irrational. That's very counterintuitive because we don't think that way in everyday life. If we see anything, we try to say, well, how did that happen? What caused that? Or if you go to a physician and they say, well, you have an illness, you want to ask, well, what caused the illness? Or why is this illness happening to me? We ask those kinds of questions. So if the universe came into being, the right question is how? What caused the universe to come into being? And the best answer is that there's a being outside of the universe, supernatural, right outside of nature, who is immensely powerful, who's outside of space and time, who brought about the universe. Now I could go into more detail on this, but the cosmological argument, which is what we've been talking about, the argument from the cosmos to a creator, doesn't tell us everything we need to know about God or the Bible, but the kind of method that I use in apologetics is called a cumulative case. So we have lots of evidence from science. We have evidence from history. We have evidence from human experience, people who have encountered God and so on. And all of this combines or forms a total or cumulative case for the Christian position. If the argument I just gave works and something doesn't come from nothing, something has to come from something, that is everything comes from God, then we have defeated atheism, right? Because atheism has to say the universe has always existed. It doesn't need a creator. And the evidence is very much against that. Or it has to say that everything came from nothing without a cause, which is irrational, is very counterintuitive. So the explanation that there is a God who created the universe is far better than the alternatives, than the atheist alternative, or another alternative, which I'll just touch on briefly, is given from a worldview called pantheism. And pantheism claims that everything is divine. There is no separation between the creator and the creature. Everything is this universal divine being. Well, that denies our common sense experience of ourselves as different from other people. And it would have to go against all the evidence that the universe is finite in time, that it came into being. And moreover, pantheism's view of God is not of a personal being who creates as an act of his will and wisdom, but God is more of a impersonal, amoral force or principle or substance that you can't really understand very well. So just given this one argument, and I'm only, I'm only summarizing the argument, we have reason to deny atheism and pantheism. So theism makes the best sense of the origin of the universe. And I'm not appealing to the Bible directly. It's that nature confirms scripture. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? This is called a cosmological argument. I mean, the simple way to put it is to say that nothing begins to exist without a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And the cause is best understood as God. We derive some of the crucial attributes of God from this argument. Okay, this argument doesn't tell us if God is a trinity. It doesn't tell us if God became a man in Jesus Christ. It doesn't tell us the way of salvation. But it does confirm that the heavens are declaring the glory of God. And God has made himself evident in nature. Romans 1, 18 through 21 teaches that as well. Okay, can I go on? <clears throat> so we've got really strong evidence from cosmology, from modern science, the best modern science, that the universe was created by a supernatural being. Let me deal with one objection to this. Some people want to define science in such a way that it, it necessarily excludes 
anything outside of the natural world. Some people then want to explain science as giving natural explanations for the natural world. So on this view, you have to exclude anything supernatural. You have to exclude an intelligent designer or a creator. Now, my basic response to that is, uh, why? Why should you exclude that? What if the best evidence leads to a supernatural conclusion? Why eliminate that in principle? I don't see any reason to do so. So I think science is the study of natural events uh, in terms of how they can best be explained. And if you're talking about explaining the very existence and origin of the universe, you have to have something outside of the universe, something supernatural or extra natural. Anyway, let's shift to biology. And we have so much to draw from here. In fact, in biology, in recent decades, we've seen a tremendous explosion of knowledge about the inner workings of the cell and how complex these machines are within the, within the uh, cell. And on both of these issues, both cosmology and biology, I hope that you will go on YouTube and look at this video called The Case for a Creator which is hosted by Lee Strobel, The Case for a Creator, because it gives these arguments with a lot of experts talking about it. And then also various graphic ways of seeing what I'm saying. It's very, very helpful. So in biology, we find things like the bacterial flagellum, which is a little outboard motor that, that is attached to the back of a bacterium that powers it around the cell. And if you saw a graphic of a bacterial flagellum and the motor on the back, you would immediately say it's like an outboard motor. Someone had to design it. It's so complex. And it's complex with a particular function that is to uh, propel the bacterium in the cell. And when you consider this <clears throat> critter, you find a universal joint, a propeller, a drive shaft, a rotor, a stator, and bushings. And all of these things are needed for its function, and none of which are expendable. So it's basically a biological motor attached to the end of a bacterium as seen through a high powered microscope. So entities like this, like the bacterial flagellum were not even known during the days of Darwin. Darwin thought that matter or rather living matter, the cell was pretty simple, just a, a glob of protoplasm. He had no idea how complicated all these machines within machines are in the cell. So Michael Behe wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box in 1996, arguing that certain aspects of biology are what he called irreducible, irreducibly complex. So there are two types of complexity, basically. I could look at my room and say that my room is complex because I have lots of books and articles and I have a computer and I have lights and so on. But I could take away some books, I could take away the light, and I'd still have a room, a functioning room. But if something is irreducibly complex, all the parts are required for the function. You take away one part, you no longer have the function. So Michael Behe has talked about the idea of a mouse trap. <clears throat> so a mouse trap requires, I think, four or five different features in order to function as a mouse trap, in order to catch mice. And if you take away any of them, let's say take away the spring or take away the baseboard, then it doesn't catch mice anymore. Well, the bacterial flagellum, this molecular motor, is far more complex than a mousetrap. You see a mousetrap, you'd say somebody made the mousetrap, right? Because it's a contrivance. You see various parts fitted together for a purpose. 
And when you look at something like the bacterial flagellum, the proper inference is not that this evolved without a mind over millions of years. The proper inference logically is to find design because you have this irreducibly complex organism. Now, Darwinism says that things evolved slowly and incrementally, one small step at a time. But you see the bacterial flagellum has to have all of these parts together at the same time. You can't take away any of the parts. So there's no plausible pathway from the simple to the complex because you have to have all of the parts there at the same time to have the needed function. The best explanation for this and other molecular machines is not mindless nature, is not atheism, but there is a designer behind nature. Now, I use this example because I think it's very visual, it's easier to get your mind around, but really the stronger argument is what's called the information argument. And that is when you look at DNA and RNA, you see all kinds of codes, languages for what happens in life. The DNA and the RNA are really the information of life. And when you find information, you find something that's specified in something that's very complex. So if I'm, let's say, mowing my lawn, as I have to do after this, after this meeting, and I just see some grass on the lawn, I'd say, well, uh, this grass is here because it was planted years ago and it just grew up in a certain way. But let's say I look on the lawn and I see that someone has uh, spray painted something on the lawn, like death to you Christians. That would make me a little afraid, but I wouldn't say, oh, isn't it interesting how this just happened without an author? You know, this message just happened. The, the leaves, the blades of grass just turned red and made this message death to you Christians. I wouldn't infer that. That wouldn't be a proper inference. The proper inference is there's a designer, there's somebody, an author who sprayed this on my lawn, right? Now that is just a very crude, simple kind of illustration for how complex the codes and information is in life, in DNA and RNA. And it is so complex and so information rich that there's no credible way to explain it without a designing intelligence. And again, I would point you to this video called The Case for a Creator and look at the section on the information argument. The greatest exponent of this today is a man named Stephen C. Meyer who wrote this book uh, called Return of the God Hypothesis. So people will sometimes say, the more science develops, the less evidence there is for God, or scientific discovery has replaced religion or has refuted the Bible. Not at all, not at all. In fact, um, I've been doing apologetics for about 45 years since I converted and I have seen the arguments from science get better and better and better, that there is a creator, brought all things into being out of nothing, and a designer. And this is the same being, of course, the principle of simplicity and explanation. And the evidence of a design is expanding more and more. Unless you put this filter over all of it and say, we will not detect intelligence behind any of this. Whatever you do, don't use God as an explanation. And that is simply artificial. That is not a good rational scheme of investigation to just exclude an original designer if the evidence points towards it. And it definitely does, all right? <clears throat> now, I haven't even given another argument from cosmology, which I'll just refer to and not develop. And that is what's called the fine tuning argument. And that is that there are all these elements in the cosmos that are fine tuned on a razor's edge to make life possible. 
they don't have to be like this, like the cosmological constant and the various proportions and laws in nature. They could have been very different. And having a different collection of features in the universe is more likely than the one that we have, much more likely. So you have to either say it's just blind, dumb luck that the universe has all these features fine-tuned for life, or you say they had to be that way, like two plus two, hack, two plus two has to be four, which is not true, they're contingent, or you say there is a divine mind that fine-tuned everything just right to make life possible. That is a very powerful argument, and the alternatives of atheism and pantheism don't explain the fine tuning at all. Again, we're inferring a designer from the patterns of nature. Okay. All right, any comments or questions on that? I know I'm go going over a lot really quickly. Drawing myself out actually, actually so you have to lubricate my, my lips here. <laughs> Okay, well, why don't we switch to history so we can give a good argument that we need apologetics and a good place to start in apologetics, especially with an atheist, is what is nature? Does the universe have a beginning? Is it designed? And yes, we can say it has a beginning given the science of cosmology and these multiple lines of evidence. We can also say that life, not just the universe as a whole, but life needs to be explained on the basis of design. Things like molecular machines, information. <clears throat> and we've got plenty of evidence for uh, a personal designer and creator from science. Now that doesn't tell us a whole lot about what happens in history. So I'm thinking of history as what happens in nature over time, especially what human beings accomplish. And according to scripture, God is very concerned with history. He created the world. He set things in order in a linear scheme of development. So he created the world one step at a time and he intervenes in the world, he calls Abraham to follow him. He sends prophets. He comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ and so on. So you might say that biblically, God is invested in history. He's a historical God. He's not a being that created the world and left it alone. That would be something like what's called deism. And the crucial Christian claims uh, have to deal with history because God reveals himself through the actions of history. You can't read the Bible without seeing that. Now you might say, well, isn't that obvious? Not all religions are like that. In fact, Taoism is a religion that isn't concerned with history at all. It's concerned with some kind of mystical understanding of nature. And it doesn't even care whether or not there was a founder of Taoism. Might have been a man named Lao Tzu but Taoists don't really care because it's a mystical philosophy. It's not a historical revelation. Uh, or even with Buddhism. Now, of course, Buddhism was founded by Siddhartha Gautama, who supposedly became enlightened and gave teachings. But Buddha is not considered God or prophet. He's just considered a wise person. So for Buddhism, the only thing that matters really is the teaching of Buddha. Buddha didn't do anything to redeem people or to reveal God. He didn't even believe in God. All right. Now, Christianity is very much a religion of God acting in history to judge and to redeem. So let's consider just the New Testament to start with, because you're interacting with non-Christians, you want to talk about Christ, you want to talk about his work of redemption. And an unbeliever could very well say, I don't think the New Testament is reliable. 
I think it's a collection of myths and legends and stories. You might find a few good ideas here and there, but you can't take it as hard historical fact. And people will often say things like, you can't trust the Bible because it has been translated so many different times. Who knows what the original was, right? Now let's just start with that. With the New Testament, we have about 5,700 Greek manuscripts of various ages and various qualities. But in terms of ancient documents, the New Testament is far better attested than any other ancient document. That when you look at a translation like the New International Version or the English Standard Version, the scholars are working with a great, a great wealth of manuscript material. It's not like they have to guess and piece things together. And there's very little um, hesitancy in how things are translated. Now, if you read a New Testament, you might see something at the bottom called a, a marginal note and say some ancient manuscripts say something a little bit different. But this only affects a small percentage of the verses in the New Testament. And usually it has no difference in meaning. It's just a different way of wording the same thing. So this is called the manuscript test. And the, the New Testament comes off very well with the manuscript evidence or the manuscript testimony. So whatever the original document said, we have good reason to believe that they have been accurately transmitted over the centuries. And if people say, well, you can't trust them because they've been translated so many times, I think what they often mean is you go from Greek to Latin, to German, to French, to English, all these intermediary languages. And if that's the case, then a lot is literally lost in translation. But actually that's not the way it works. The way it works is, the scholars go from Greek to English or Greek to French or Greek to Polish or whatever it is. So it's not like you have all these intermediary languages that muck things up. You go back to Greek, to the language, whether it's English or French or Polish or whatever it is. <laughs> so the next issue would be, okay, maybe these documents have been reliably transmitted uh, but what did the original authors say? So who were they, right? Were they trustworthy? What you have in the New Testament reads like history. People like C.S. Lewis have commented on this. Contemporary scholar Craig Keener and others, J.B. Phillips pointed this out also. They don't read like myths and legends. They don't have that literary quality to them. Now they include miracles, but the miracle stories are not embellished. They're very direct. They're not fanciful at all. And let's just leave it at the gospels for a moment. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Matthew was a disciple of Jesus. Mark was a companion of Peter. Uh, Luke was a very diligent researcher. You see that he's a historian par excellence. Look at Luke 1, 1 through 4 about that. And then John was a follower of Jesus. He was an apostle. So these are people who are in a good position to know what they're talking about. They are eyewitnesses of what they're recording, or they consulted eyewitnesses. All right. And then we also have a lot of extra biblical corroboration of much of what the New Testament teaches from people like the Jewish scholar Josephus or Tacitus, they confirm some aspects of New Testament history. All right, let me deal with one objection to this, and then we'll talk about Jesus. Some people will say, okay, the documents are reliably transmitted. I'll give you that. The people that are supposed to have written them might be in a good position to know things. But the problem is you have all these miracles. Jesus walks on the water, Jesus casts out demons. That is not credible. We know that miracles don't happen. Now, a good question there would be, how do you know that? Why do you say miracles have never happened? 
someone might say, I've never seen one. I've never experienced one. Well, reality is a lot bigger than your experience. And moreover, a lot of people today will claim to have experienced miracles. And there's good evidence that even today, people are supernaturally healed and so on. Uh, there's an excellent book by Lee Strobel about that called The Case for Miracles. But let's go back to our argument about the origin and, and design of the universe, right? If there is a supernatural being who is inferred from the best science, then that kind of a supernatural being could work a miracle. If a being can create and design the universe, then the same being could raise someone from the dead or could perform some other kind of miracle, something outside of what nature would do in and of itself. So just ruling out miracles, forbidding miracles as some kind of a philosophical principle doesn't really make very much sense. You have to look at the documents, the coherence of the stories. And with Jesus, he works so many miracles. He's so supernatural that to take away the miracles means to take away the whole story. But the story has been given by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's corroborated by the Apostle Paul, whose writings probably are earlier than the Gospels. So we have a strong case from history that the New Testament is reliable. So let's look at it with respect to Jesus. What kind of a person is Jesus? Well, as I said, he is a historical being. He's not a shadowy, mystical figure, but he existed in space and time, and we have his biography in the Gospels. What kind of things does Jesus do? Well, for example, in Mark 2, he says he has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And people are upset by this. They say, who but God can forgive sins? And Jesus doesn't back down at that point. He's claiming to have divine authority to forgive sins. And then later on in Mark 2, he's in a dispute, an argument about the Sabbath, and he says, the son of man, that's a title he used for himself, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now think about that. The Sabbath was created by God. It wasn't created by Moses or one of the prophets. So if he is the Lord of the Sabbath, that means he is God. He's the one who created the Sabbath. Or think of John 10, 30 through 31, where Jesus says that he is one with the Father. He is claiming to be on the same level as God the Father. And there's so many other claims. Another excellent one is John 8, 58, where after another religious argument, Jesus says, before Abraham existed, I am. Now, that's interesting. It sounds funny. Before Abraham existed, I am. Well, the I am is a reference to the name of God, the very name of God that we see in Exodus 3, 14. Moses said, what is your name? When he's interacting with God through the burning bush that was not consumed. And God says, I am who I am. And when Jesus said, before Abraham existed, I am, he's claiming to be God. And people understood that because they took up stones to stone him. They thought he was blaspheming. They thought that he wasn't God when he was. So, Either Jesus was right or he was wrong in thinking that he was God. If he was wrong, he was either a deceiver or deceived. So if Jesus claimed to be God, the God of the Old Testament, and he knew he wasn't, he would be a deceiver. He would be lying to people. What possible purpose would a Jew in first century Palestine have for claiming to be God when he knew he was not God? This is a very radically monotheistic culture. They worshiped one God. The great confession was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6.4. There be no reason for a mere man who knew he was a mere man to claim to be God. So if he wasn't a deceiver, then he would have to be deceived. 
meaning he was mentally ill. He was unbalanced. He was radically deceived about his own condition. He was not God, but he thought he was. Well, when you look at the record of Jesus, his teaching, his interaction with people, he does not appear to be an insane person. He was very intelligent. He kept his cool. Uh, he was not the kind of person you want to put in an, an insane asylum. So basically, you've got this. Jesus claimed to be divine in many ways, directly and indirectly. He was either right or wrong about that. If he was wrong, he was either a deceiver or deceived. He was not a deceiver or deceived. Therefore, what he said was true. He was, in fact, God incarnate. Now, you might think that this argument is too simple or it's, tr it's a kind of a trick, but it isn't. And I go into great detail in my book about why this argument works. In fact, a lot of people have found this argument in C.S. Lewis. It is some, sometimes called the liar, lunatic, or lord argument. You find it in Mere Christianity, for example, by C.S. Lewis. And we also know from scripture that this man who claimed to be God also claimed to offer his life up to redeem the human race. He said that he had to die, he had to be betrayed, and that he would be killed and he would rise again on the third day. So given the miracles of Jesus, given the claims of Jesus, his claims and credentials, we see that he went to the cross and he said on the cross that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt abandoned, at least he felt abandoned by God. But he also said, it is finished. And he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And the biblical teaching is that three days later, he showed himself to be the resurrected Lord. The tomb was empty. And there's good evidence from history that he was buried in a known location. The tomb was empty. He appeared to many people over a period of time. And he changed the life of his disciples from being defeated to having great faith. And they became people who wanted to take the message to the world, even to a hostile world. So the best explanation for what historians will usually admit, that is, historians of the ancient world of that time, was that, yes, he was buried in a known place. The tomb was empty. Uh, many people claimed to have seen him. And those who claimed to have seen him had the courage to share the gospel, even in the face of great hostility. So the argument is that even non-Christian historians will believe these four points. And the best explanation for why these four points occurred is that he in fact rose from the dead. That's the best explanation for why the tomb was empty for the claims of appearances and for the changed life of his disciples. So the other explanations just don't fit. So you might say, well, what about the disciples? We know that early disciples proclaim the resurrection. Now let's do this. Either they were right or they were wrong. If they were wrong and there was no resurrection of Jesus, then they were either deceived or deceiving. So if they were deceived, they knew Jesus didn't rise from the dead, but they said he did. You have to ask the question, why would they? Why would they go against the religious establishment of the Jews saying he rose again from the dead when they know he didn't? What benefit would there be for them? No benefit at all. They'd be taking on all the authority and they would be jeopardizing their lives and so on. So the idea that they knew he didn't rise from the dead, but they said it anyway, is not credible. What about this? They thought he rose from the dead, but he really did not rise from the dead. Well, you'd have to wonder how they could come up with that, because the Romans knew how to kill people, to crucify people, and they knew how to guard tombs. So how could they be deceived about this? What could cause their deception? And... Uh, some scholars will say, well, they hallucinated that Jesus rose from the dead. But the short answer is that this doesn't fit the way hallucinations work. There are too many appearances, different places, different times. And 
the hallucination hypothesis just does not explain the facts well. And I go into that in more detail in my book. So the best explanation is that Jesus rose from the dead victorious over sin and death. And moreover, and I'm drawing things to a close here, we can have some time for questions and comments. We're not just presenting a list of facts about Jesus that are well supported from logic and history. We are. We're also claiming that Jesus is the answer to the human problem, that Jesus gives us, and only Jesus gives us, what we need to have meaningful and significant and truthful lives. That is, we are people who have fallen short of the glory of God. We cannot save ourselves. We have violated the law of God. We violated our own consciences. And so we need redemption. We cannot do enough good works to be saved. Through the works of the law uh, shall no one be justified, Paul says. So let me give you one scripture. There's so many. The achievements of Jesus best answers the human condition. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I am the gate, the only gate. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus came to atone for our sins, to set us right with God, and to give us a new pattern of life, a new worldview, and to live within us, to guide us and strengthen us and lead us into what's right. And I have this quote on the bottom of page four from my favorite philosopher, Blaise Pascal, said, Jesus is the God whom we can approach without pride and before whom, before whom we can humble ourselves without despair. So when we come to Christ, we can't be prideful. We can't say, I'm on good terms with you, Jesus. I don't need you to die for our sins. The cross will offend our pride. But also when we humble ourselves before Christ and receive the salvation that he gives, we don't become a nothing. We don't become a zero. We're made in God's image and likeness and God loved us and came to redeem us. So we know that we have a solid living relationship with the living God through what Christ has done. So there's no place for pride, for arrogance, but in our humility, we actually find strength because we realize that all good things come from God. We lift up the empty hands of faith and we want to be an instrument of God to bring good into the world. So let's go back to Steve Jobs for a moment. This brilliant young man who comes to his pastor with this problem called the problem of evil. I haven't given you by any means a full response to this issue, but what you can say when you see terrible evil, like children starving, like war in Ukraine, or like the terrible mass school shooting we had in the United States recently. You can say, I don't really see the purpose in this at all. It's evil and you can condemn it as evil because it goes against the character of God, the law of God. But you can say that there is a very strong cumulative case for the truth of Christianity, that we explain evil on the basis of the fall. There's something wrong with the world. Human beings abuse their moral responsibility before God, but that God has not abandoned the world. He is still interested in what happens in space-time history to the point of coming himself in the person of Jesus Christ and experiencing the worst possible suffering that could ever be experienced on the cross. This suffering, however, was to bring redemption. It was to set people free from their bondage to sin and Satan and death. And even though we can't understand why a lot of evil things happen, we can put that lack of understanding within a framework of knowledge. The universe declares there is a God. God entered history. We have good reason to believe 
that these documents are reliable, that Christ worked wonders, he died on the cross, he rose again, he's coming again. And Christianity better explains the cosmos and history and the human condition than any other worldview. So rather than saying, I'm giving up on God because of all the evil, it's better to say, I want to trust God and work against evil as much as I can. And I know that life has purpose and meaning because of the reality of God as he has revealed himself in nature and history and supremely through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So that's uh, a basic apologetic in a nutshell. There's so much more that can be said, but I have been working to develop an apologetic and respond to the various intellectual challenges to Christianity now for uh, well over 45 years. And I remain convinced that the Bible is true, that the Christian worldview makes better sense of reality than any other worldview. It gives meaning for life, for death, for happiness, for suffering. And even when I am deeply troubled, as I was in the decline of my wife's health, my first wife's health, I have to go back to Peter because Jesus asked Peter at one point, Peter, will you also leave me? Because people had left Jesus. They couldn't handle some of his teaching. This is in John chapter six. And Peter says, to whom else will we go? You have the words of eternal life. So I am troubled when I see evil, it seems to make no sense. I was deeply troubled for years over why my wife, Rebecca, would get this horrible disease that would take away her brilliant mind. But Lord, where else can I go? You have the words of eternal life. And I know too much to turn back. I know way too much to turn back. Okay. And I should also say, before I maybe leave some time for questions, that um, after... Uh, I have remarried in the last few years, and I'm in a new chapter of life. I give thanks and praise to God for that. Uh, I ended up marrying a woman named Kathleen, who I'd known way back in high school, and we reconnected at a high school reunion a few years ago. And Ecclesiastes says there's a time for every purpose under heaven. And one of the contrasts is there's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. And I had a very long season of mourning with Rebecca. She is now in a new chapter of life with the Lord, free from the suffering she went through. And I am in a new chapter of life also with, um, with my new wife and with lots of ministry opportunities and so many good things to enjoy. So I give praise and glory to God for all that. Thanks, Dr. Groteis. We have about um, 10 minutes. Um, I think one question I get asked quite a bit, you know, in here we have a lot of students, we have a lot of uh, workers. Of course, all these, all of us have families too. Mm -hmm. um, in your experience, what's a good entry point uh, let's say for to to have some of these conversations with the non-believer, um, and how do you balance? <clears throat> there's this saying that the the atheist says, you know, there is no God, and I hate him. Um, so yeah. how do we how do we balance um, our arguments uh, with with also speaking the truth in love, knowing perhaps that person is where they're at belief wise because of some experience that they've had. Right. I think it's important to have an overall intellectual apologetic that you can bring to bear, but then you need to bring it to bear on individual people if you're having a conversation or to bear on the group that you are addressing in one way or the other. So you want to be very sensitive to the individual person's history and personality. And it could be that what's tripping them up is not so much... Uh, an intellectual argument against Christianity is that they've had some very wounding experiences in a church. So you might need to talk about that and say that, um, 
the Bible is very realistic about human beings who are fallen and even people who have been redeemed through Christ still make mistakes and sin and so on <clears throat> and don't give up on God because a church or an individual has hurt you. So um, I talk about the spirituality of the apologist quite a bit in my book and when I teach about this. So we should be prayerful people. We should be asking for opportunities to share the gospel and defend the gospel. We should work at being humble and having strong arguments, but not be overbearing or cocky about anything. And then also develop, we need to develop uh, skills of listening, what's called active listening, to really try to get inside another person's mind and heart the best we can. And a good way to do that sometimes is if we're not sure what the person thinks or what their objection is, you might say, so you're saying this, this, and this, so you repeat it back to them. Um, or you maybe respond to an objection <clears throat> and you say, does that help? Or did I miss the point or something like that? So on the one hand, you need a very um, competent apologetic, you might even say a way of answering objections and a way of presenting Christianity, have that internalized. And then when you interact with individual people, you draw from that, not just like, okay, listen to my lecture now, shut up for the next 15 minutes while I give you a lecture, but you ask them questions and then you draw from your knowledge in responding. And it should be a dialogue. It should be interactive. Anyone else question for one of the one of the let's say questions that, that I would base on like nature science nature science field hello <laughs> uh, would be would be a question about evolution so I'm I'm medical trained myself and to be honest for me the problem with evolution theory is that it doesn't seem to for me, it's a very good religious, like, okay, not a very good, but it's a religious belief. Mm -hmm. And it's not really a scientific theory because if anything is supposed to be scientific, it has to be observable, for instance, and it's not observable. So it's some Lego pieces that we connect and we tend to believe that they are true. But can you also help us out like how to, how to approach this maybe? Right, well, a lot of people that hold to Darwinism don't even admit the possibility that it could be refuted, that it could be falsified. And if that's the case, then they're really not operating in a very scientific way. It's more like they're holding a dogma that this is the only way to view nature and nothing could possibly contradict it, you know, or refute it. But there are a lot of things that refute the idea that life has no design, that it all happened through a mindless process. And I've given you some of that already right? I've got a lot about this in my book, Christian Apologetics, in terms of the flaws in Darwinian thinking, its inability to explain things like the bacterial flagellum or the informational nature of DNA and RNA and so on. And I think that the design hypothesis is far better, is far better attested by the evidence and the logic than um, Darwinism is. Now, some people want to try to reconcile Darwinism with Christianity. I'm not one of those people. I think that when you look at the science of Darwinism, it does not fit the facts. Uh, Darwinism can explain some things like variations within species, or it can explain maybe minor cases of one species developing into another one, but it cannot account for the major groupings are the major categories of life. You really need to understand that a designer brought that about. And the fossil record doesn't support this long, gradual, slow development of the first life to everything we have now. Um, Jonathan Wells has worked on that. He has a book called Icons of Evolution. Stephen C. Meyer has done great work on that as well. So if you're talking to someone who uses Darwinism to refute Christianity, a good thing to say will be, well, what is your evidence for Darwinism? And have you heard of the intelligent design movement? Have you heard of these challenges? 
and you could say, let's watch this video, the case for a creator. It's all scientific evidence. It's not mystical experience. It's not just quoting the Bible. So I would take that kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks, Dr. Grotex. Um, I don't know You're if you've welcome. seen. I don't know if you've seen it on people's faces, but we've had an amazing uh, sunset in the background. Another. <laughs> oh, good. Of the uh, of the beauty of God and God's evidence yeah. in nature, and uh, so we really appreciate your time. And um, could you uh, could you pray for us as we? Yes, close? indeed. Thank you. Lord, thank you for this gathering. We thank you for revealing yourself to us in nature and scripture and through Jesus Christ. Please equip us to better understand and defend our faith that many people would come to know Christ. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Gertz. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for day. listening, everybody. And um, Clint could give you my email. If you'd like to email me with a question or a comment, sure. I'd be happy to follow up on that. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. All right. Okay. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.